microscopic cog in his catastrophic plan, designed and directed by his red right hand. Dudes, that was from Nick Cave's song, Red Right Hand, which has become really popular lately. It was on a TV show, etc. The phrase, Red Right Hand. I mean, what a, what a vivid image. The flag of Ulster, which has come from a whole other legend. Okay, but the, the phrase, Red Right Hand, is from John Milton. And uh, people usually associate it also with uh, a Latin turn of phrase and Horace's odes. But Red Right Hand, I mean, that's English poetry right there, baby. Totally alliterative, totally a powerful image. The red right hand. And in the song, the song is about someone powerful and violent. And it's interesting to know that it's taken from John Milton in that context. But it could be just some dude. It might be God. Fascinating. In Paradise Lost, in John Milton's Paradise Lost, it is about God. It's God's red right hand. And I want to talk about God's red right hand. First, though, I want to remind those of you who support me on Patreon. Thank you so much. If you haven't seen the video for the giveaway, several of you guys have already chimed in. Everyone gets two books from my library. Uh, just let me know what topics you want. Just drop some in the comments, send me a message on Facebook, whatever. Uh, military history, history, arts and culture, poetry, theology. Okay? So you get two books. So just let me know what you want, and I'll choose for you. All right. And if you don't support me on Patreon, by the way, please do so. It would be wonderful to keep these videos going. All right. So, the red right hand of God. I'm going to start by reading a, a, kind of a lengthy quote from Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost is this, this poem in which uh, the, the angels have fallen, there's been war in heaven, they've fallen, and, and now they're going to sally out in war again against man and against God. Okay? Uh, and so much of the book is the demons, all the false gods, talking a strategy, how to wage war against the so-called Almighty, right? So, in book two, they're all arguing about this, and Moloch, right, the, the baby eater, Moloch advises his counsel is to go to war, go all out, because, what's the quote? Um, if this be not victory, it is at least revenge. Something like that, right? So, he doesn't care if they lose. He wants to extract as much revenge against God for casting them out and making them try to shelter from him in hell. So, war all the way. If it's not victory, at least it's revenge. So Belial, another demon, god of old, actually counsels against this. He counsels against war. Because to him, it could get worse. All right, so Moloch says, war, revenge. So I'm going to read to you Belial's counter-argument. First, what revenge? The towers of heaven are filled with armed watch that render all access impregnable. Oft on the bordering deep encamp their legions, or with obscure wings scout far and wide into the realm of night, scorning surprise. Or could we break our way by force, and at our heels all hell should rise with blackest insurrection, to confound heaven's purest light? Yet our great enemy, all incorruptible, would on his throne sit unpolluted, and the ethereal mold, incapable of st stain, would soon expel her mischief and purge off the baser fire victorious. Thus repulsed, our final hope is flat despair. We must exasperate the almighty victor to spend all his rage, and that must end us, that must be our cure, to be no more. Sad cure, for who would loose, through full of, though full of pain, this intellectual being, those thoughts that wander through eternity, to perish rather, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night, devoid of sense and motion? 
And who knows, let this be good, whether our angry foe can give it or will ever. How he can is doubtful, that he never will is sure. Will he, so wise, let loose at once his ire, be like through impotence or unaware to give his enemies their wish, and end them in his anger, whom his anger saves to punish endless? Wherefore cease we then? Say they who counsel war, we are decreed, reserved, and destined to eternal woe. Whatever doing, what can we suffer more? What can we suffer worse? Is this then worst, thus sitting, thus consulting, thus in arms? What when we fled amain, pursued and struck with heaven's afflicting thunder, and besought the deep, deep to shelter us? This hell then seemed a refuge from those wounds. Or when we lay chained on the burned, burning lake, that sure was worse. What if the breath that kindled those grim fires awake should blow them into sevenfold range and rage and plunge us into the flames? Or from above should intermittent vengeance, vengeance arm again his red right hand to plague us? What if all her stores were open and this firmament of hell should spout her cataracts of fire, impendent horrors threatening hideous fall one day upon our heads, while we perhaps designing or exhorting glorious war, caught in a fiery tempest, shall be hurled each on his rock transfixed, the sport and prey of racking whirlwinds, or forever sunk under yon boiling ocean, wrapped in chains, there to converse with everlasting groans, unrespited, unpitied, unreprieved, ages of hopeless end, this would be worse. War, therefore, open or concealed, alike my voice dissuades. And then later it goes on to kind of hint at uh, the psalm that says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. I believe that's Psalm 2. Okay, the red right hand. The red right hand of God that goes to war and is, is mighty and it is vengeful. It is to be feared by those who war against God. Awesome. This video is not just about the red right hand of God. It's about the right hand of God. What does God use his right hand for? in scripture. If we look at the Psalms, God uses his right hand for two things. As we saw, God uses his right hand for war. I mean, we saw it in John Milton, but we see it in scripture too. He uses his right hand for war. And he uses his right hand to build and throughout the Old Testament, but especially in the Psalms, it's not just talking about God's glory and power when it talks about his right hand. He doesn't just go to war. He doesn't just work, build. Pardon me. He goes to war for his people. He builds things for his people people. That's what I get for talking and swigging beer at the same time. God uses his right hand for his people. That's amazing. This red right hand that demons fear. This red right hand that brings vengeance. Brings vengeance on behalf of his people. His right hand is for his people. Absolutely amazing. But you know what else his right hand is for? So God's right hand is for war and for work. It's also for rest. Sit thou at my right hand. We affirm in the creed that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God and from there he rules the world. In Psalm 16, says that at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And I guess that's what I've been thinking about lately and I want to share with you guys. I mean, God's right hand is a hand of rest. It's a hand of Sabbath. It's a hand of gifts and rewards and grace. Grace. He gives us 
delights forevermore. He sets a table for us in front of our enemies. And he bids us feast in the place of honor, to sit at God's right hand. God's right hand is terrible and potent, and it is our Father's right hand. God's right hand, as terrible as it is, is a right hand of blessing. Okay, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, As always, any requests, please make them known. More reviews will follow. More meanderings and meditations like this one will follow. And again, I'm going to ask you guys to consider supporting me on Patreon. I would absolutely love to get a few more of you guys on because, of course, it gives me more flexibility to do more videos, to spend more time writing on my blog. Check out Joffrey the Giant on, on uh, Blogspot, joffreythegiant.blogspot.com. Check me out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The peace of Christ be upon you.